So now I will call to order the meeting of the regular uh, Northampton School Committee meeting on February uh, 14th, 2019. Um, I'm not going to ask for a roll call because we had that in our previous meeting and I don't see that we've lost a quorum. Um, and so then I would open it up for the public comment period. Um, and anyone who wishes to make a public comment could uh, step forward. I don't know if we, if anyone has signed up. Mr. Harrell, are you? Uh... Okay, please step up. I'll let you sign yourself. Um... No, I'm the clerk. Okay, so if you could just um, sign up here. If you could just state your name and uh, an address for the record. And um, I will uh, I will have a timer set for three minutes, um, and um, okay. Whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Would you like this uh, back? <laughs> That camera is a side view. <laughs> uh, my name is Steve Harrell, and I live at 51 West Farms Road. In 1980, I founded Harrell's Ice Cream, and though retired now, over that time I employed about 700 young people, and many were students at Northampton High School. Tonight, I'd like to give you a brief history of time, of the start time, that is of that school, which is currently 7.30 a.m., and to remind you about events of the last 10 years. For those of you who may not be aware, there has been a lot of serious, reputable research regarding teen sleep and school start times, which, if too early, are detrimental to students' health, academic performance, and safety. You can easily find a wealth of this information online. One main point is that during sleep, our brains absorb and remember what we learned the day before. With, insuffi with insufficient sleep, we don't learn as well. Teens are not getting the sleep they need, and an early school start time contributes to this problem. Teenagers are driven by an internal biological clock, and these circadian rhythms make it difficult for them to fall asleep generally before 11 p.m and difficult to arise before 8 a.m. Serious discussion of the start time in Northampton commenced in 2008. Much concern was focused on the school buses. To save money, we used the same set of buses to transport all three levels of students, one after the other in tiers. To provide for a later high school start, more buses would have to be added at an increased cost. Of course, a later start time makes for a later end time, too. How might this affect athletics? In 2012, an ad hoc committee was formed to study this and all other implementation issues. In their final report, this committee explained actually how little would be the actual effect on sports. So in June of 2013, <coughs> the school committee passed a resolution with a vote of seven to two to implement a later start time by September 2014. This, this resolution was later rescinded because no one, <clears throat> because no one was sure <clears throat> just how much extra buses would cost. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Superintendent Provost did some serious work, and in February of 2015, he stated that a later start would increase the annual bus expenses by $91,000. This amounts to about one quarter of 1% of the then budget. Still, no further real action has ever been taken on this important issue since that time. Meanwhile, a year ago September, the start time was made later in the entire public school system of Seattle, Washington, and as a result, both grades and test scores increased. I, tonight, I just wanted to uh, remind you of some of these things and to not let this issue completely uh, wither on the vine. Uh, it's still uh, an important and active issue in much of the country. Uh, if anyone is interested in picking up on this issue, feel free to contact me. My name is Steve, and my number is 
727-8188. Or you can leave a note at Harold's Ice Cream. And thanks to all you committee members for such all for all the hard work you do. I think we appreciate it. Thank you so much, Steve. We appreciate your comments. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak during the public comment this evening? Okay, hearing then, uh, hearing none, are there any announcements from members of the school committee? <laughs> no. Alan. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make the rest of the committee aware of um, an opportunity that exists um, to have a voice in the, the MIAA. So I've been serving, this is my second year as the MIAA basketball rep. Um, and while a lot of what we do is minutia, um, voting on shot clocks and choosing a tournament, official tournament ball and all that, there are some pretty serious issues of equity and access and um, uh, budget uh, implications that come up um, during the work on these committees. Um, there's also a question of gender equity on the committee. Um, I have 23 male colleagues and only three female colleagues on the committee, which makes it interesting when there are issues of gender equity that come up re um, related to sports. Um, I feel like I have to fight particularly hard. Um, so anyway, um, the MASC is allowed to have one representative on each of the MIA um, sports um, boards. And there are currently seats that are unfilled. And I do think it's important that we have a voice in it. And I think that we can make a difference um, in addressing some of these issues. So if anyone's interested, um, the MASC will send out, I think next month or the month after, um, sort of an invitation to sign up for any of those committees. And um, they only meet three times a year at Franklin, Massachusetts, which is far, I understand. Um, and they do reimburse you for travel expenses. So. I just thought I'd put out the call to see if we could get some more representation on some of these boards, because I think it does make a difference. Thank you. Anyone else have any announcements? Okay, um, hearing none, uh, we will move on to uh, recommended actions. Um, we do have a consent agenda this evening um, that consists of the uh, minutes of the rules and policy meeting of October 4th, 2018. Uh, school committee meeting minutes of September 26, 2018, uh, school committee meeting minutes of October 11, 2018, and the school committee meeting minutes of the January 10th, 2019 meeting. We also have several field trip approvals. Um, I think one of them will be pulled, right? Oh, okay. So we're actually pulling, um, we're going to be pulling the rules and policy meeting minutes um, of October 4th. And um, we're going to pull the Leeds Elementary Grade 1 uh, trip uh, to Symphony Hall in Springfield um, because uh, neither of those actually are ready for a vote and one doesn't require a vote. Actually, the committee one doesn't require a vote anymore. Um, and the Springfield trip doesn't require a vote. Um, so those are actually just um, sort of uh, uh, shouldn't be on there. So. Um, so we also we do have the NHS co-ed varsity wrestling uh, trip February 15th through the 16th uh, to Methuen High School in Methuen, Mass. Um, we have the NHS co-ed varsity wrestling trip to February 22nd, 23rd, 2019 uh, to St. John's High School in Danvers, Mass. We have the NHS girls ultimate frisbee uh, trip April 13th to the 14th to Shelburne Fieldhouse in Shelburne, Vermont. The NHS Senior Class of 2019 uh, trip uh, to High Meadows on May 22, 2019 in North Granby, Connecticut. Then the NHS Robotics Team, March 8th and 9th, 2019 to Wilby High School in Waterbury, Connecticut. The NHS Ro Robotics Team, March 22nd and 23rd, 2019 to Bryant University in Smithfield, Rhode Island. And the NHS Indoor Track uh, team, February 27th, 2019, to the Reggie Lewis Center in Roxbury, Mass. Uh, and then we have a budget transfer, uh, student services for translation of 55,660. So um, uh, would someone make a motion, but uh, we, again, we'll be removing the uh, first set of minutes and the first field trip, not to vote on separately, but just they don't actually require a vote at the school committee. Move to approve the consent agenda. Items, the two items mentioned by the mayor. Is there a second? Uh, I have a comment. Okay. 
I'd like to um, remove the meetings from Thursday, October 11th, because I have a correction to offer to them. Okay. So that one is removed. Um, any other? Could you second the motion then without removing? And I'll second the motion. Okay. Um, so then the, um, the vote will be on approving the consent agenda uh, minus the October 4th rules and policy meeting minutes, the October 11th school committee meeting minutes, um, and the Leeds Elementary trip to Springfield Symphony Hall. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we'll move to the... Uh, Minutes of October 11th, 2018, and Ms. Voss, you wanted to make a um, make a motion to approve with a correction. Yeah. So the correction I'd like to make the motion um, for relates to the public comment period. It's labeled as E, and it reads. Eli Marlin and Izzy Donnelly, both students at Northampton High School, spoke about issues with integrated math at JFK in the high school and in favor of the proposed math study. They presented the mayor and the committee with signatures of the, of the petition to support the proposed math study. And what needs to be corrected is the petition that they presented was not had nothing to do with the proposed math study. I'm not. I don't recall what they said about the proposed math study, but this, the petition was um, uh, for integrated math. It, 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 asked, it asked high school students to sign a petition asking Northampton Public Schools to reevaluate math curriculum, and it was signed by 226 students, and I believe it was in June, so it was long before the consultant was ever proposed. Um, so. Anyway, that I'd like that corrected, please. Okay. So, is there? Um, did you catch that? Do you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, we'll change it uh, did from petition to support the proposed math study to petition to reevaluate the math curriculum. Does that work? That works. And and you know, I think um, I think we were gonna somebody was gonna share that with the school committee at some point. So it's good we came back to that. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so there's a motion made to approve those October eight, uh, October 11th minutes at, with that amendment. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent. <coughs> Thank you for catching that. Um, the next item on the agenda are our reports and recommendations. Um, and so the first among them is a report from our student representative, Michael Diaz. Good evening. I um, just want to start off by thanking you for allowing my colleagues to come and present to you um, earlier. Um, it means a lot to us. Um, first item on my report um, is an update on um, our school's um, track teams. Um, Western Mass Finals were recently held. Um, girls track um, after going undefeated in their regular season um, did lose by one point in their championship and will rank second in Western Mass. Um, which is still a great achievement, um, while the boys track did win their championship. Um, in other sports related championship news, um, NHS senior Jordan Vandergriff um, won third overall at the Western Mass slash Central Swimming and Diving Championship, um, was beat out by two Central Divers, so she is um, for this year the best diver um, in Western Mass. Um, so congratulations to her. Um, We've discussed this before, but the town hall meeting, which is sponsored by a, um, a large number of social justice clubs, including NHS Democrats, um, Environmental Club, et cetera, um, that will be held tomorrow at the high school at 6 p.m. Um, with our new representatives. Um, there's a new, um, there's an independent group at the high school that is starting a textbook lending library, um, which is um, in order to lend um, textbooks, specifically Smith textbooks, um, to high school students that are participating in Smith class. That way they don't have to go out and purchase them, um, whether it's because they're only using it for one class or because they can't afford them. Just making those resources available um, to all students, not just the ones that can't afford it. Um, so that way they are allowed to our access to take Smith classes. Um, speaking of Smith classes, second semester is up and running and a lot of students are in the middle of it all. Um, the Student Union um, has made, printed, and posted um, a series of um, posters up around the school um, 
that are sort of infographs um, discussing um, the epidemic that is vaping in our high school. Um, they are currently working on what ways can we, um, as a representative body, combat that or at least inform um, their classmates about the, the dangers and the effects of certain actions. Um, the junior class held a dance last weekend. They held their Cupid Shuffle. There were um, games and foods and, of course, dancing at this dance. And um, the students that, that attended um, reported that they had a great time. Um, and finally, there were auditions for um, Northampton High School's theater department, their spring um, production of the play Snow Angel. Auditions and callbacks were this week and the cast list is to be posted tomorrow, and I'm sure the cast, whoever it is, is gonna be excited to work in that production. Um, and that's all I have for you guys this month. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Michael, we appreciate that. Next we have the 2019-2020 um, uh, uh, school year NHS program of studies, uh, which requires uh, the city council to take a vote of approval. The school committee, city council, sorry, that's next week, uh, uh, vote of approval. Um, and I now have Principal Lombardi come and present that to us. So I believe it's been shared with you already. Um, and I think this year, um, Rebecca, you'd be happy that we put in blue the changes. Mm -hmm. So I think that should help you all. Um, so I guess with that, since you all received a copy of that and it's clear what is new, I'll open it up to you if there are any questions or concerns you have, what you see for our um, intended program of studies for our next school year. Uh, Ms. Voss. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it, it's always really fun to read it and see all the huge diversity of classes that are offered and they I want to go back to high school and take some of them. <laughs> um, I do have a few questions, I guess I always do, but um, I, I, I just have three questions, so I'll just go okay. through them. Page 15, um, it, it's in blue. It says, students enrolled in an honors class may not withdraw from the course to take a Smith College class. And I could imagine why that might be in there, but I, I want to make sure it's, that we think it through and that I understand it. Um, why is it an honors course? So, and so maybe you could help us understand it, but also if you want to take a Smith College class, where I see the challenge is you, have, you sign up for these high school classes, you might have emailed a professor at Smith and said, I really want to take your class. And most likely the response you get back as a high school student is, that's great if there's room you can take it, but I'm not going to know if there's room until September. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what students do in that case. They probably go enroll in a Northampton High School class. So my, my question is, why can you drop non-honors classes to go take a Smith class, um, which is what this, I think, is implying, but you can't drop an honors class. Sure. Um, it's not meant to imply that this class is better than that class, but we do find, we have found that when a student is interested in a Smith college, um, and you're correct, they won't know officially until the fall. We register for classes in the spring. We make decisions on what we're going to run, how much um, staffing we're going to put for certain subjects as well. What we have found in the past is issues with running classes of eight peer honors, which tend to be singleton or double classes, not as much as a class like a, um, an English nine, which we have 10 sections. So we, typically a class that might be one or two sections. And what we've found is that we've made decisions in the spring about how many sections and staffing. We get to the fall when we have um, Smith, and all of a sudden those numbers go down to a number that would have made us question, was that the wise decision for our staffing a number of sections? And we found that usually impacts the honors and the AP levels. So we said we, we, we can't have that because we need to be um, cautious and making sure we're using our resources as best as possible. So what does a student do who um, wants to take a Smith class and doesn't get in it but is, you know, trying to take something at a high level? Like, what do you recommend if a student comes to you? I, I'm, this policy 
It, you know, it, it's it's hard, and I've been here for uh, I've been here for a while, and we have struggled with this for a while because, uh, in one sense, we want to honor those students that have opportunities for Smith. Um, typically, if you're doing a dual enrollment at GCC or HCC, it's a little more clear whether they're in or not. Um, so it's really hard to hold a spot in the class where you you want to make sure they have access to as as rigorous classes we have or arts or things like that. Um, we don't really have an answer because they really don't know until the fall, but at the same sense as in building principal, I need to make sure that we're making decisions on what, so what class sizes and what teachers are teaching. And we have yet to find a specific answer because we don't, it all hinges upon Smith and what they're able to say to us. Um, so that, that is, I don't have, we have yet to find an easy answer that says you can be guaranteed this class or this class you can drop out of, withdraw for another. It, it really is complicated. You know, um, um, can I ask a question on the subject? Sure. Before, I know you have more questions, you said. But um, so how often does it happen? Or what, what was the, what's the shift here? What did you used to do? What is this changing to? And how often we, do you We've started this? this probably about two years ago. We okay. found, again, that we were running um, some uh, classes with really low numbers. And we didn't find that to be appropriate when we had other classes that hot, had high numbers. So maybe you had an AP. I can't go back to the specific class, but we've been right. noticing patterns of having classes of, you know, 12, 13. So a we, low number because a student started in the class and then left I, to take a Smith class. It was high. Made the high. decision based on high. this is the appropriate amount of instructors to have for this course, mm -hmm. or this is, this is the appropriate amount of um, offerings we'll right. have. And then come the fall, when we're kind of noticing we're maybe have high numbers somewhere else, and we're looking at our um, our classes, and we'll notice, well, geez, this class is now lower because students have withdrawn over the last five days for Smith. Because they didn't in the fall say what they were going to take a Smith class in the spring. They don't. They don't I mean, know. In the spring take it in the fall. They don't know what. They don't know if they're in that class. Right. So they can tell yes. us. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. yeah. And so when they registered, they registered for a Northampton class. Yeah. And then they're in that class, and they withdraw from that to meet their schedule at Smith. Got it. So they can't decide at the beginning of a semester that they want to take a Smith class if they haven't, if they've already had a other another class in there. No, I'm not, I'm not saying. I'm not saying. No, that. you're not saying that. No, what, okay. what we're saying is that when you decide to take a Smith class, yes, you, know, you should talk to your, your, your guidance counselor, and the class that you're going to drop to take that, we're letting them know that it can't be um, honors or advanced because those, those tend to be, you know, single ten, maybe a double ten class that we have to really make hard decisions. Is that a class of? You know, a, one class of 32, or maybe two of 16. Okay, we'll do two of 16, and then all of a sudden you're maybe running two of 12, right. or one of 16 and one of 10, and it's like, well, geez, that could have been one class, and that teacher could have gone somewhere Got else. It. But once the school year starts, you can't really shuffle teachers and schedules around. Right. Got it. Thank you. So. Um, Ms. Voss, do you have a follow-up on the same topic, or did you have a follow-up? That was just a clarification on this same topic. Yeah. So this has been your policy as far as AP classes, right? It's yes. It's only the honors classes yep. that you're adding to this? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you. I, sure. I, I, maybe I'll just clarify one thing, because I'm understanding it better. Um, so if a student wants to take a Smith class, their best bet is to just not schedule another advanced class they want to be taking at the high school during that time slot and then they can mm -hmm. if they don't get in the smith class they obviously have to take something at the high school yeah. and maybe they'll even get in an honors class if they're yeah. but they just can't commit to it yeah. is that unfortunately a fair yeah. way to say it yeah okay. it, it's it allows us to have more access to the resources and decision making and that's why we do that Mr. Diaz. Yes, yeah, so I think just to clarify, as a student at the high school and who's currently enrolled in a Smith class, um, my experience has been that when we sign up for classes in the spring, that our guidance counselors make it clear, you know, we can't drop honors or AP, um, but we're still asked to select an, an, like an academic course to fill that slot. We still need to have eight credits enrolled, and we're allowed to leave a little memo 
at the bottom saying that I would like to drop this academic class for a Smith class. Obviously, we don't know if we get into the Smith class until later on. Um, and although it's still a memo, it doesn't seem like there's anything really binding to that desire to take a Smith class until the semester starts up. So it seems like it's still a little, really we have to wait until the Smith semester comes around. If, I hope that. Clarifies. That helps. And yeah. is it problematic for students or is it fine? I think some students might find it problematic just because at the spring they have a desire to take a Smith class, you know, that <laughs> semester in the fall. But there is nothing that really, aside from that memo, which isn't binding in any way, there's nothing that like they can do in the spring to real to actually solidify that they want to take that class. There isn't like a option to take a Smith class and then enroll. Like you have to officially enroll in the class before you can drop it, which I think some students might find frustrating because then they go back to their guidance counselor and say, "I want to take a Smith class," and like, "Oh, well, you signed up for poetry." You know, it's difficult to get like that binding commitment early on. You could also do a double switch where you could have a, something as a placeholder. I know this from my own family experience, but you could have a, you know, you put a placeholder in first period because you know you're going to try to take a morning Smith class. And then if the Smith class falls through, then you could also switch to another class, another academic class. Well, then we don't necessarily know when yeah. class, like what high school class is going to be offered true. in the morning either. Like that's not that's necessarily. That's true. Yeah. I was fortunate enough that, at least from my experience, I was able to take a class that was offered at all four periods of the day that then, depending on what my Smith class was, I'm able to drop that class whenever. And that just worked out really well for me, but that's not the case for most students. True. So I'm curious from a student perspective, is there a way this could be worded or thought of with a slightly with a slight twist within what we're hearing are the issues that would be better from the student perspective or do you think this is the right way from a student perspective to handle it? Well, I think I don't know a lot about what actually goes into scheduling. Yeah. I understand that that's a yeah. really complicated monster to deal with. <laughs> um, what I think that I would like to suggest is maybe in the spring give the student an option to fill in as one of their credits college course, whether it's Smith or GCC. I'm not sure how realistic that would be going forward, but maybe a way to actually solidify when they sign up for classes that they have an intent to take a college class and then maybe give them the option if they don't get in to drop into one of the courses that are currently available. Yeah. But I do understand that there are lots of scheduling conflicts that go into that. I mean, where I'm coming from is, and I understand you want to be consistent with everyone, but if these kinds of things said something like students enrolled in an honors class may normally not withdraw from the course, or some word in there, because right now I'm aware of several honors and AP courses at the high school that have more than 30 students in them. And um, I would think that a student or two leaving some of those would be good for everybody. This course gets smaller or smaller for the teacher, and the student gets what they want, a Smith class, which is just as you know, demanding in a sense. But I do understand you want to be consistent, but I just wonder if there, there might be a place to be a little flexible. Again, I, th I think it's hard once you, once you deviate once, then it's, it just opens that door. And, and again, I think I can just say for past experience, we have found that to be, it's kind of like what um, Mayor Narc was saying, you know, the, the term placeholder. And at some point, you need to make a choice, and if and, and if you want that Smith College class, I think it, then you, then it's worth going for. It's rigorous. We support that, but at the same sense, you know, when we're making other decisions, having a student say, "Well, I want to kind of have it that placeholder with an AP course and hedge my bet. If I don't get that, I'll take the secondary." We don't think that's fair for decisions that we have to make that also impact other students as well. So we we find that by being very clear up front. Um, we're happy with the results because we do find that we're able to use our resources better. And, and I, I'm not sure if that would necessarily alleviate the calculus class of 32. I can't say that. I can't really draw that as a, as a correlation. I think we have a lot of students that are, are interested in, in advanced coursework. Did you have other um, questions? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, are we done with? Are you going to keep? Um, I have a couple other things on the handbook, but if it's this particular... No, no, it's on the handbook. I just... Uh, yeah. I have something on the same page. Okay, right go back. for it. So um, this is just a wording suggestion. Sure. Um, and, it, it, and it's 
again in blue, these things I'm asking about are the blue things. Yep. Um, so it's about the wording for the advanced placement, the new policy and how it's worded. It says, um, although Northampton High School does not require students to take the AP exam, colleges may require the exam in order to possibly count as college credit. I think that's a little confusing. Um, and I just offer a slight change, which would be something like, colleges usually require the AP exam to award college credit for the AP course. Can you email me that? I'd be happy to. And, and then bring that to people and I can have my guidance. That's fine. I, I'm at. happy to do that. And then continuing that when it talks about students taking an AP course will be required to notify their teachers within the first three weeks of the start of the course whether they will choose to take the college board exam, they will receive a form to complete designating their choice. I think that's fine, but I don't think it's the current practice. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but in my experience that students weren't asked in the first three weeks to commit. It was much more recently in January, and I just want to make sure what's happening is actually what's reflected sure. here so people aren't confused. Yep. And you can figure out that. And then I have one more question about it, but if people have a question on this page, I can wait my turn. No. Okay. Um, my other question is much further down, and it's just when I was reading about the special ed class offerings and... So what page are you on? Um, I don't know. Okay, I got special ed. Um, okay, yep, I'm there. Let me find it. 69, special education. Um, So, so I'm the school committee rep for the CPAC group and I've been attending their meetings and listening to a lot of parents who um, have students in this class called Learning Strategies and um, it, the way it's scheduled creates problems for, family, for students who um, maybe don't need a whole day, a whole mm -hmm. 80 minute, I guess, um, class. How, how many am I 83. saying? 83 minutes of learning strategies every day. And so there's been a lot of discussion about can we be flexible so that some kids could do other things during the week and maybe have learning strategies one or two or three days and not five days. And so um, there were a lot of ideas put out and it sounded like progress was being made and there's no change in the handbook. So I just wanted to find out if when we should expect there to be a change um, sure. and what's um, going on. So, so currently we have, we have a high school team of um, special education teachers, administrators, um, as well as associate director of special education. And we're currently in the process right now of discussing what might be some other options, um, including strategies, but, but, but different. Um, and so that's our process now. We're hoping to have this in place on um, these communications as part of our transition meetings with JFK um, starting in March, that we, as well as our own um, IEP team meetings for, um, in place for next year. So learning strategies is blue in here. It looks like it probably got changed, and I'm just some of the um, the verbiage. It used to be um, learning strategy was always broken down by grade, grade okay. nine, 10, 11, 12, and we're trying to shift away from that as well. So this is trying to just encapsulate a very general um, description of what learning strategies is, because of the time that we go to print for this and approval. Um, we're not there yet to put in what might the other options be um, for that. And that's also not something that would be something that you would, re you would um, register for for courses. It would be something that would be part of a, a team process. Dr. Provost? I would just like to amplify Mr. Lombardi's answer by saying that um, some of the models that his team is looking at would require a change to contract language and they have given me some um, model suggestions to communicate to the negotiating team when that process gets underway. Okay, no, that's good. I think what, what what's helpful for the community to know is you're working on it and yes. I mean I think a question they would want me to ask so I'll ask and I don't know if you can answer it is is it is there hope that by next fall some students will be able to have a more flexible experience yes. in learning strategies yes. we're, so we're, you expect we're, we're very aware and we Great. encourage the community that um, one size fits all um, opportunity for student services is not the way to go Great. do some students need it every, every day absolutely but there's a lot of other areas we can go, and we're actively looking at that with our down. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, Ms. Brennan. I think, that, I think Mr. Mr. Kaufman Scott. actually was next. Okay. Right, I'd first like to ask if my colleague is waiting for a natural break. Uh, you are? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
So I, thank you. I did look at the program of studies. I particularly focused on the uh, blue areas. So I just had a couple of comments sure. and questions about that. But first, I just want to say that I do have an opportunity as, as part of my work to look at programs of studies throughout the state. And we just have a great program of studies. It's just well written. Your introduction is nice. I think it's, it's just the array of courses that we offer is pretty amazing. Um, and I've grown more and more impressed as I've looked at other districts, so I think it really reflects the community and the things that we value, so thank you for everybody for that. Um, the parts in blue that I really stuck out this year, actually I don't, I, I love the inclusion of the K-12 transfer goals, so thank you again Dr. Chevers, for your work and your team of teacher collab uh, collaborators and contributors for that. I don't think that's in blue, but I think this is the first year we included it, isn't it? So having those because it was done last year, and I think it's it was done, done last after. Year. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I just think it's a great accomplishment, and just the fact that it's now um, becoming part of the fabric of what we talk about and what's being uh, uh, transferred in terms of communication and stuff is great. And it being in the program of studies is just another indicator of how I think it's going to continue to inform our vertical alignment of K-12, and it's great. So thank you. Um, and I was also very impressed with, array, with the array of alternative education options. And many of those were in blue. I don't know whether they were rewritten or they're actually new options or whether they're just in a different place. Um, and I don't, want, I don't really need to know that now. I just want to say that it's, again, it's an impressive thing that we're offering alternative. I don't know why we even call them alternative education options. So many of them are so rich and so great and so valuable. I wish every kid had to do a, a senior capstone or was you know, pushed to doing that or taking child development. These are incredibly valuable skills. But um, the fact that we have those, um, again, really stands out as really, um, really nice for us as a community. Some real quick questions. Um, I saw that there was a school to career position highlighted in blue that wasn't there last year, so I didn't know whether that was just a retitling of, of somebody who was oh, I, position, I, okay. or whether it was a new position. Or beginning from Misha Began, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the, yes, um, that's been here, that just used to be called our internship coordinator. Okay. I think we feel that school to career is a little more appropriate what we're trying to do. We're trying to get students, not just internships, but a, a mindset for careers. So um, this used to be um, Donna Waterman's position. It was yep. part time, um, again, work study internship coordinator. Um, and when she retired, Misha came on, and yep. she is our part time person in that role. Yeah, no, I, I think I knew that. So it's not, a, it's not a revamped job description or job responsibilities. It's a different title. Different title. And, <laughs> and with the young lady that's come with um, you know, a more relevant, more um, contemporary experience with that. And so she's bringing some other elements to the program that wasn't there before. Um, it's not, not a slam on the fine work that Ms. Waterman did, has done, but um, Misha has um, you know, a, a newer experience with it, newer knowledge of that, yep. and bringing some elements to it that I think are bringing rigor, but as well as a career mindedness and a thoughtfulness about um, workforce and career um, connections. Yeah, for sure, great, okay. And uh, two more things. So one, um, I don't know if you know this or Dr. Provost, but I, was, I have the understanding that the state is going to require more civics education. Mm -hmm. So is that just going to take place at the middle school, or is that something that we need to factor into high school graduation? It's both. Oh, it's, both. it's both. Um, yes. It will, be, it will be taught in eighth grade, but that will um, require some adjustments to the high school history sequence. So um, you'll see that in the... Um, the, the graduation requirements listed right now, there's a list of graduation requirements that doesn't um, comport with the current graduation policy. It's because it reflects the uh, changes to the high school history sequence that the high school is recommending at this time. Of course, for that to really become effective, the graduation policy needs to change. And later on in the agenda, there's a request to refer the graduation policy to rules and, and uh, Whatever it is. Policy. Rules and policies, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, I'd, go ahead. But, but I, so I can say in terms of, yes, in terms of um, the, the main instructional component will be in the eighth grade for civics, but for the yeah. high school, um, all students will be doing a civics project, which will be, will be embedded um, within the, um, the curriculum. Of, uh, so it won't be a separate course requirement, it'll be a separate unit within a, a required course. Yep. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. And then the last thing, um, this is something I brought up before. I know you and I have talked about it, and um, I just want to revisit it again, which is um, I think there's still confusion around the policy for how students advance in math 
and okay. whether there's options to take a pre-course assessment um, to um, to test out of a, a class, for example, and particularly as students are moving from eighth grade to ninth grade. Um, and I don't know whether the program of studies is necessarily the place to put that. I don't know what you distribute when you talk to eighth graders, okay. but it seemed like a logical place. And my concern that I had uh, a couple of months ago that I raised was just that I spoke to students and teachers, yourself and some other administrators, and they, I kind of got different answers as to what options are available to students when they move from eighth grade to ninth grade. So it ranged from whether they went to a private school, a public school, whether they could test out, whether they had taken a course at the high school while they were at JFK, and um, and whether they needed it and whether they didn't need it, and it all made sense to me. But the problem was that I was hearing different answers from everybody, and so I think um, I'm just wondering whether whether we do have a policy on that, what options are available, and if so, is there a plan in place to ensure that everyone knows what it is and understands it as particularly as you introduce the options to the middle school kids. Yeah, and when you say a policy on what, I forget the words you just used, policy on. I think it's, what I'm looking for is what options students could take in ninth grade math. Okay. Yeah. Can I just say, it's because you do state for foreign languages, for instance, if you took a year of this, go into this class, if you mm -hmm. took two years, if you're coming from another school, you need to, t to speak with, okay. yeah. to be assessed, but we don't do it for math. Yeah. So I think he's, he's discussing, like, where is your natural placement, depending on where you come from. Yeah. And so if the, if the policy is that everyone goes into IM1, then that should be stated somewhere. Okay. So do we have a policy, Mr. Lombard? Yes, so students when they come up from, from JFK um, are placed into IM, to IM1. And then when students are there, if, if students are, are um, within the first week, teachers will be doing pre-assessment, engaging students, and if teachers at that point identify students are presenting um, um, content mastery that's making them question are they in the right um, course, then they can make a um, recommendation for them to either go up or down depending on what, where their, um, their skill level is. Um, and that's the, that's the same thing in world language as well. Yeah. Students that come from schools outside of um, Northampton, um, we go by their transcript. We take a look at their transcript, what is this there, um, and that sometimes might mean a conversation with someone from another school to explain what math, and then the department chair will make a determination based on what they're seeing from that transcript. Yeah, and so if you said during the first week uh, a teaching notice is, can a student also make that request? I'm wondering if they feel like, I looked at the syllabus, I'm talk to the teacher, I whiz through this first week, can they also make the request to test out? We wouldn't call it test out. I would, no. have, them, I would have them speak to the teacher, and oh. it's what we're going to see uh, from again, them doing pre-assessment, whatever work they're doing in the class, and things like that. Okay. So I don't want to debate the policy, actually. I just want to make sure that that's well known. So I think Mrs. Fallon's idea that is, is like other courses, it's, it's inconsistent. But if we included that, I think it would be helpful. There's already a section in math that says recommended courses. So it's just starting in 10th grade. And more importantly, I think if it's not if, it's not, if this needs to be published soon for your trips to JFK, just to ensure that that's the information that's shared, because I did hear that that isn't necessarily clear to the kids at JFK as they're selecting math. That would go a long way to helping uh, alleviate my concern and I think helping kids make a good selection. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay. So Can I comment she, on that? Sure. On Sounds like we've got. Like to move to another subject. If you want to make a comment or a question, that's fine. Well, I just kind of want to, I mean, I think it's consistency is an important question in this case because um, we say on the one hand you have to switch classes within three days, so that that decision about what's the appropriate level of math for you is really important. My understanding is that there's one IM te one teacher that gives a pre-assessment in that first day or two and moves kids up or down accordingly, but the other teachers don't. So I don't get a feeling that there's an, a um, consistency across the IM one teachers about how we're treating kids who are coming in and that there is a problem with a lack of equal access to information of what it takes to to move so right. Thank you. I'll, I'll bring that back and um, talk with um, the department chair and deal with these issues okay thanks uh, um, dr. Pro just, and then sure just to speak to that that very question um, again I'll go back to some of our findings from the district review process I'll say that um, since the the final meeting where the sub 
where the full committee discussed math study, there have been a number of meetings between the high school math department chair and middle school math department chair, sometimes different constellations of administrators at those. I can say that one of the topics um, among that has been having consistency among teachers in their decision making. We haven't really figured out exactly what the process for that would be, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were some inconsistencies in the way those ninth grade teachers are making their decisions, and so we want to try to work on that. That's great. Great to hear. Thank you. Ms. Voss, did you have a... Um, yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd just like to share, to add to what my colleagues are saying, and um, it is very important to be transparent for families and to how we place kids in math in ninth grade, just like with the languages. I think that's a great example. And um, the reality is kids are different in math when they come into ninth grade. And we do have at least one teacher giving tests right now. I've had parents contact me to ask, what is this? How, wh what do you do as a parent? Just people in the community. And you get a really different answer depending on who you ask. Um, who you, you know, what, how loud you're willing to bark as a parent, you get, diff you get treated differently um, from what I can tell. I, I know the students have brought up um, if you come from a private school versus a public school, you have different options in how you place into math. And I think we need to be very transparent. And in this case, I'd really advise against making it one size fits all. But we need to treat all the kids the same and give everybody the same opportunities to be placed in the appropriate math course, however you all want to do that. When all of this changed, now close to five years ago, you can go read the Gazette article. We used to have a reporter from the Gazette sitting here, and I've reread them recently after people have brought this to me. Um, they all say we're making changes in math, and there's going to be a test given before night, some sort of placement available if you want to take it so you can be put in the appropriate math class. And that's, that's what was said five years ago. So I think this is a really important topic, and we do need to be consistent. And maybe it doesn't make it into the handbook this year, but it certainly should be made transparent to the sure. families. Sure. No, I, I, I agree with you. I do. Okay. Ms. Burnham, you're next. Um, thank you so much. Um, places that I was so excited to see were these new computer classes that are going to be offered. So exciting. And I really loved the section on the English language education. Um, which was, uh, you know, addressing a big population that we have, and it was, it's really, really great to see those um, additions. And the only thing that I was going to ask is on um, page, um, the school counseling department page, which is page nine, um, we clarify on page eight that it's, um, that they're, we say school counselors and school adjustment counselors and then down we say the role of school counselor and then we have the language the guidance counselor and I just would love for us to unify the guidance counselor in all of those spots when it's the guidance as opposed to um, school adjustment counselor. So um, I can bring that back so guidance if so school guidance counselors as we would all refer to them now the terminology is school counselor and and so they so we actually had our so they they prefer themselves and as we're school counselors. And they kind of want to shift that way, but they also okay. realize people aren't aware. So that's why they put the guidance in that one to. I wonder if you just want to move it so it's the, the school counselor, you know, acts as guidance or guides the. I mean, if you're going to make the change, it feels really, it felt really like sticky and. Okay. As, you know, all of us come from a place of guidance and then to just see it once. I would, I would just see if there's a. Mm -hmm. you know a softer landing <laughs> but it, it was really exciting to see okay. the offerings thank you Ms. Bisansky so I just had one quick question sure. the um, world language you, placement policy which I which is in blue so I take it it's new has that changed it used to be if you took a language at JFK for two years you went into the first level of a language now it looks like you're going into the second level of language just curious so th this is new because it's new here, yep. Um, and but in terms of where students are being placed after at JFK to here, that 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 part is not new. So if you did when you did two languages here, yeah, when when you did uh, t 
two, you would come into that part. That Got it. All locks, that we have not changed that. You were just Yeah, explained. we just added this, this is new here, along the lines that um, Mr. Coffin was bringing up, to have something transparent for people to see what the policy um, was. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Fallon. Um, so, because I'm gonna be asking the committee to refer the graduation requirement sure. policy back to the subcommittee to discuss. Can you just give us a little background on um, under required course sequence for class of 2023 in history? Um, it's sure. a world history one or two courses will be required to be determined. Can you talk about the changes? And Because we did the change it in the. Uh, yes, we did. Back. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, it came to our attention um, at some point over, over the fall that. Um, DESE was putting forth new new standards for history and recommendations um, of, of new standards for schools. Um, districts are allowed to implement that in terms of three classes or four classes. They are asking the standards for US 1, 2, World History 1 and 2. Um, so we need to, to confer, we're, we're currently in the process of wrapping our heads around this, what are the standards, what are going to be our recommendations for courses. We're definitely going to be recommending a US 1 and 2. We would like to have that um, in terms of US being um, beginning of the sequence for students because when they come up from eighth grade they're going to be having um, units on US and civics. So for that continuity to have that at the high school level so by the time they get to world history one they would have the full gambit of all aspects of u.s history um, what we're not certain about is to recommend th three courses or four we have to find out where we do those remaining standards our concerns with having four um, as we discussed pr previously is what does that do to a student's schedule of having more required classes it, it really locks them up um, so those are things that we are going to be determining and, and this is also linked, there, there's potentially going to be down the road a, um, a social studies history MCAS test. We're just not sure when that is coming um, as well. Thanks. Ms. Hennessy, you had a question? So, my, my time in history. I'm sure. The only thing about this for me for next year's book is that because we don't know what it goes to rules and policy and what mm -hmm. the requirements um, Northampton is going to be. The, the freshman class or the first year class next year, the class of 2023, this is they're still reading this and they will be taking world one as um, ninth graders or no. This is where we're all kind of things. Right. So, the, the reason this, this, um, information was put in there even though it's not consistent with the policy is that we want to signal to eighth graders that they should take U US one. So they will be the class of 2023 20, coming in, and the second line really applies to them. Obviously, it's going to have to require a great deal of counseling support because it's confusing that we have something in here that's, that hasn't become policy yet. But we want the eighth graders to take US 1, not World 1. When um, I was speaking to, to Karen Hidalgo today, she's the director of guidance, and you know, we're talking. She does not feel this will be an issue because when the counselors go down to, to assist the eighth graders in um, registration, they will most definitely be informed you, you need to take a history. And we will put in the course registration for them, the, the corresponding um, ability to sign up for a history course, and by the time we navigate to where we need to navigate, we'll put that into the schedule. So she will actively, each counselor is fully aware of what they need to communicate. Um, and when they get the registration sheets, what we'll have available to them will not be confusing for them. Okay, I find this confusing. So, yep. and I get it, it's only for one year and that the changes will be super clear. Yes. But um, I'm not comfortable with that, but I have nothing else to say on that. Yep, no, I agree, there's too many to be determined. Yeah. At, and are you, yep. I'm sorry, can we, one last part of this, and, and so, you're going to start in 2023 with that graduating class having the US 1 2 modern world, not or, um, world history, not modern, but yes. Okay. So, so next next yep. year's incoming would be part of this, yep. everyone else. And it's kind of like you're just phasing yeah. one in, Absolutely. phasing one out. And we do have the staffing to do that. Okay. Yep. Ms. Boss, and then Ms. Burnham, and then Ms. Bissanski. Um, can you, I didn't know I had this question, but now I do. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about? where there's going to be the offering of an honors version of these history classes? 
M most likely, there would probably be um, an, uh, an offering. Um, and again, we haven't fleshed this out, but I would imagine it would be along the lines of a U.S. History II or World History, or maybe U.S. History, would, um, they would have an opportunity for the AP. And those would be the parts that we would have to determine. Those have been things that have loosely been discussed. So um, I think it's really important to not lose the opportunity for students to take honors history. Um, yep. And if about five years ago, we lost, students lost that opportunity to take honors history as part of whatever was required in the freshman year of high school. Maybe it was six years ago. So, but, so I would say all, all, all freshman courses yes. you know, are designed for a heterogeneous Experience. That's right. Um, but for um, for the world history too, just like for chemistry, um, the second com component there is an honors. Level. I, I just want to make sure when there's a new sequence, the second history course would be offered also at the honors level. Yeah, we're, we're fully aware of that. Um, and yeah, we're, we're having those discussions because it might be actually a AP. You know, we're, we're trying to determine. Well, a student, for example, right now typically AP, AP US. Most students are taking that in their junior year. Um, how many students are going to want to take AP US after going through two years of, AP, of regular US and world history? We're, we're concerned. So we, we are tossing about you know, what we think is going to be the best way to offer advanced rigorous coursework, but also not kill something and not um, Underserved. So just, definitely, it is part yeah, of just discussions. Just to be clear, the track would be the second history class would be an option to be at an advanced we're, we're, level, we're, whatever that is. Yes, we're currently that is on our radar. Yes, thanks, oh, Susan. Thanks. Um, and I was wondering, would it be clear if it was like to be determined by DESI or something? I mean, this does feel. But we're determining it. So but yeah. we're de it's, so it's, it has nothing. Okay, I thought that you all were saying that if if DESI changes it. That that's what no, we're we, we, we okay. I misunderstood. Yeah, we get to. The, they've set the standards that need okay. to happen. Um, we're the ones to determine how many courses, and we're the ones to determine to have honors or not. That's that's not right. Desi. That's um, the school and school committee working together. So, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Yeah, just one more quick thing. I think this year we um, school committee funded ASL for the first time. Yes, American Science. Yep. And it looks like you're adding it next year. And you can have uh, ASL2, ASL2 yes. which is great. Is yep. that, a, can you give us any indication on how popular that course was and how it went? Yes, yeah, so, so we probably, overall, um, I think right now, uh, last semester we ran the course with under 20. Um, this semester it's above 20, and we're getting, talking to the teacher, we feel it's pretty hot that students were going to have you know, robust class sizes that will want to have a ASL1 and 2. Um, with robust size class sizes of about 20. Yep. Kids are excited. You know, you, you want, um, finding a lot of kids are excited, and we also find that it, it's a it's across all levels. Um, so it really is one of those true experiences that you have students of different abilities, different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's a class. If you ever want to come by, I can bring you. It's a it's a silent class. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense if you think about sign language. But I mean, <laughs> really, um, the, the instructor is also uh, <coughs> deaf. And yeah. so it is, again, it's the only class in the building. There is literally no talking yeah. at all. And I think the kids find it um, unnerving. But I think in the same sense, some kids really like it. It takes the pressure off. And we're seeing kids really come out of their shells. That's so right. there's a lot, a lot of real positive experience. That should be the class we make an exception on the cell phone policy just to twist things up. Just the, there you go, right? Yeah. So um, do you know whether students take this in addition to another foreign language, or is this? Oh, I know they're allowed to just take this, right? To so, satisfy. So, so right now, so, so right now, this is just an, an elective. Uh, we do not have we do not have a world language as a requirement for graduation, um, and and because this is the, only the first year offering ASL two, um, that's where the guidance counselors will have to do some research. How is that viewed at a college level for them yeah. to count that as two two languages? Yeah, I was also curious whether students are taking this in lieu of taking Spanish or Latin or French. Like, do they see it that way, or are they taking? I don't think both? that's that's part of the narrative right now. Yeah. I think it really depends where this where this goes. Again, we're only right now um, ASL one for one year. Right. And so, how many students right now are seeing that? Uh, unclear. I'm not sure if our guidance counselors right now would be steering them away from a world language to this because I don't think they're one. We have enough. Typically, you're going to want to go beyond two years 
for, for many languages, yeah. and I don't think we're fully aware of how what status we like that equal bill at um, universities as well, right? When compared to a, you know to a French or a Spanish, right. for example. We'll find out. I'm glad we supported it. I'm really thrilled to see we're adding another section. Yeah. More advanced. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on the same page, we, we just had a really pretty spectacular presentation by student, members of the student union um, about wellness. And so as a result of their presentation, it makes me curious, um, listed grade 10, 11, and 12. We heard w a lot about grade 9, but um, activities and seminars um, related to wellness education. I wonder if you could just tell us for grades 10, 11, and 12, what that means and how flexible it is in terms of um, is it the same every year or is, is there some flexibility in it? Sure. So, so right now, we're, um, we just wrapped up our second year for grade, grade 11. What we're trying to do is get to a point with the relationships with community-based um, agencies and um, providers um, that we could do the same thing every year. So for f the freshman experience um, is um, doing um, a trip up to um, Berkshire East um, for um, zip lining and they have an outdoor adventure park um, and for the juniors this year and this we did a mountain day we brought the whole junior class to uh, Mount Tom and we hiked up at Mount, Mount Tom um, those are our general activities that we do we're working currently right now putting things together for the spring which would be again Berkshire East uh, we're trying to put together a white water rafting but there's a lot of things we're working out in terms of the details um, if students are unable or do not want to go, they're given an opportunity for an alternative um, assignment. It's a Google Classroom that Mr. Derby um, presents to them. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Okay, just sure. Anyone else have any other um, questions? Okay. So, I um, feel like we vetted that pretty well. Um, I need to have a motion. Move to approve the 2019-20 um, Northampton High School program. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Thank you, Principal Lombardi. And Ms. Foss, if you want to send me with that word. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, now we have a series of uh, financial and donation related requests. Um, first off is a vote for a transfer of funds for um, NHS ESP, and this is uh, Dr. Provost will discuss this. This is an ESP that was not included in the budget last year because the student enrolled at Northampton High after um, the budget was passed. We fortunately were able to cover the position for the first half of the year with the ESP who runs the in-house suspension room because um, we had a very good first semester in terms of low in-house suspensions but at this point we don't think that we can rely on that staff um, unfortunately we do feel like there will be some in-house suspensions needed over the second half of the year and so we're transferring funds from a tuition line item where we have less than ex anticipated expenses to the ESP account in order to create basically half the position it's a full-time position but only for the second half of the year okay is there a motion to make that transfer motion to the transfer of funds for the NHS ESP position. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, next we have some donations. Um, uh, the first one is the Ultimate Frisbee Boosters, uh, $1,500. Ms. Candy, do you want to speak to that? I know. Sure, so we've received a $1,500 donation from the Ultimate Frisbee um, for the general expenses, um, and the athletic director has asked the school committee to approve that gift. Okay. Motion to accept the donation, NHS Ultimate Frisbee, Frisbee Boosters in the amount of $1,500. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion about that? All those in favor of accepting this donation, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next is a donation to R.K. Finn Ryan Road uh, 
PTO, um, and the PTO is making the donation for 2,445 for projectors. So the PTO has offered um, to give us a gift of $2,445 to buy five projectors. Um, this was in lieu of last month. They wanted to buy some uh, computers, so they would rather buy the projectors. Okay. After. Motion to accept the donation from RFK Finn School PTO in the amount of $2,445 uh, $2, for projectors. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any, obje any abstentions? Okay. Um, next is uh, Bridge Street uh, PTO uh, making a donation, um, and I'll have... Uh, can you describe this one? Sure. Uh, the Bridge Street PTO has offered a gift of $8,410 to purchase new playground equipment and materials. So there's an imagination playground materials at $2,355.65. Flowers outside the music instrument, $3,200 approximately. And Rainbow Sambo's Outdoors Drum for $2,754. Motion to accept the donation from Bridge Street PTO in the amount of $8,410. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion on this one? I'm hearing none. All those in favor of accepting the donation, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next is a, um, a nursing scholarship, uh, $25,000. Can you, do you want to speak about this one? Sure. Uh, we've been contacted by the attorney that's handling the estate for Mr. Berger. Um, part of his will has actually um, set up a perpetual scholarship in the amount of $25,000 for a nursing scholarship. Um, and I've asked the school committee to accept that so the treasurer would be authorized to set up that scholarship account. Is there a motion? Move to accept the donation, uh, Carl W. Berger Nursing Scholarship in the amount of $25,000. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of this very generous scholarship, um, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And f uh, finally, a, um, this is a donation by the NHS PTO uh, for band instruments. That's correct. The NHS uh, PTO has <coughs> offered a donation of $1,960 um, to purchase instruments for the high school band, $1,960. Motion to accept the donation for NHS PTO band instruments in the amount of $1,960. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Just a quick note that was about $40,000 worth of gifts from community and from various PTOs. Always amazed that the not amazed by the generosity of this community to support education. So thank you, everyone. So, um, uh, because it is tax season, we now have a refund that we're going to vote on. Um, <laughs> this is a uh, this is a refund to uh, uh, the Northampton Association of School Employees, and it is the return of an unspent uh, gift funds. Um, totaling $24,163.03. And I don't know if the superintendent or the uh, business administrator is going to speak to this. I will uh, speak to it since I was here at the time that, when the gift was made. Um, this, uh, if you turn to the back of your sheet, you can see the accounting um, on the gifts. These were payments made to the school committee by NACE during the time when the full-time release presidency was in effect. Um, there was a balance of $24,163.03 at the time the program came to an end. So this re um, return of funds would just close out the balance in that account. Okay. Um, Mr. Meyer. I'll wait for a motion. Okay, is there a motion to, uh, to approve this refund? Gift refund. Yes, motion made. Okay, great. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Meyer. Um, so I just want to point out something since I was present at the negotiations of the first two rounds of this agreement. Sometimes when everybody knows something, information that's critical does not get included in the agreement. 
and I think that that happened in this case, I think it's going to result in us refunding $6,195 more than we really should be if we were honoring the intent of the parties. Um, during the first year of this release, due to the late hiring of the replacement teacher, we had $24,000 uh, roughly more in the gift account at the end of that fiscal year. I believe that the intent of the parties was to leave that money in the gift account to be applied to the release going forward of the president. Um, you can look and I don't think there's any correspondence or any requests of a refund of that money at the end of the first year. Also, if you look at the agreement in year two, the district agreed to accept $49,323, which was less than the amount that we had paid or the rate at which we had paid the teacher for the previous year. It also makes no provision for benefits, which the replacement teacher had not taken in the first year, but in negotiating, we had no assurance of that. And it also made no allowance for unemployment costs which was always something in the school committee's mind when we went forward with this agreement was that if the arrangement ever ended, the replacement teacher would have to be compensated with unemployment benefits if they were not able to obtain employment. Um, the operative language uh, that unfortunately was not expanded was in paragraph 1B, in the event that the salary of the replacement teacher exceeds $49,232, or $232 the committee will bear the additional cost. I believe the mistake was made in communication between the school committee and administrative personnel that bearing the administrative cost should have resulted in a deduction of the $6,195 from that gift account. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, and at this point, uh, I'm gonna vote for this motion tonight, not because I believe the amount is the amount that was agreed to, but because the litigation costs, uh, if we were to litigate this with some ambiguity, would probably amount to $5,000 very quickly. Um, so it's, it's a strategic vote. Um, again, I think it's un unfortunate, but I think if there's any dispute about the money going forward, I just wanna make it clear that I feel that we are refunding um, an amount that is significantly in excess of what we should be refunding. Anyone uh, have any other comments about this? Okay, so there's a motion that's been made and seconded to um, issue this uh, refund of gift funds in the amount of $24,163.03. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. The next item on the agenda is a um, vote for emergency impact aid assistance for homeless children uh, in the amount of 2775. Ms. Lamica? So that was a grant that we had applied for that we received those funds. So it is actually a grant fund um, for a total of 2775. Okay. So we'll be accepting these grant funds then. Okay. Is there a motion? Motion to accept the emergency. Emergency impact aid assistance for homeless children in the amount of $2,775. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All those in favor of accepting that grant, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next, we have a vote. Uh, this is um, at the request of uh, Ms. Busansky, and this is a vote to invite um, uh, State Senator Joe Comerford and uh, Representative, State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa uh, to speak to the school committee. Did you want to describe that? Yes. It's pretty, oh. Should I vote for that vote? I don't. Um, I don't think it's a paid speaking appearance. It's not. So I didn't know if it would be misconstrued as mean. You could certainly abstain to okay, be great. just whatever, to be on the air on the side of caution. I, okay. but I won't move to pay, have a pay. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> yes. Um, should have had her on Valentine's Day, so you would at least be. I know we could be together. Date night. <laughs> so, um, but Miss Busansky. Well, I mean, I do realize some of us get to talk to Senator Comerford more than others of us at the table. <laughs> Not on this side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so the idea Sam, came maybe. about when I was a, attended the mask day on the hill and talking to some other school committee members that they have their state legislatures come and speak once at least once a year if not twice a year and I think we have a real opportunity with our new legislative team to uh, start this tradition and have them come. I think we all know that they're working on the education reform issue and I think it could just possibly strengthen our partnership to that end. So I'm bringing it before you for a vote, for your approval. Okay. The, um, so uh, would you like to make that motion then? Sure, I'd like to make a motion to invite Senator Comerford and Representative Sabadosa to speak at the school committee, at an upcoming school committee meeting. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Any one opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, okay, so we will extend that invitation on behalf of the uh, school committee. Thank you very much. All those in favor? In the, okay, yeah, fine. We'll extend that. So it passed um, nearly unanimously with one extent, abstention. Next, we have a vote to approve a job description, I believe, for a garden classroom coordinator. And I'll have Dr. Provost uh, talk about that. In your packet, you have the job description for garden classroom coordinator. This position has been filled through a contract that was supported by NEF. Um, this was a recurring NEF grant. Um, I believe that the grant was in existence for at least six years. Um, the last time it was renewed, the understanding was that um, FY20 would be the year in which um, NEF expected the district to be ready to take on the garden program as a sustainable funding source or a sustainable um, program within its within its budget. So this job description is prepared in anticipation that we may have more flexibility if we're able to fill the position um, through unit A um, as opposed to continuing the contract. Of course, if no one applies, we could still continue the contract. So this is um, it proposed as part of our plan to take the garden program fully under the school budget. Okay, Ms. Burnham, do you have a question? I, can I say that I think this is very exciting that we are um, moving toward really saying that this is a part of our values and a part of our schools? Could you I make channel a that motion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to <laughs> make the motion to move garden classroom coordinator. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Mr. Kaufman. Yeah, Dr. Provost, how come you um, at this point haven't included like uh, numbers of hours a week or pay? Is it just premature at this point to do that or is there a strategy behind that? Uh, there's no strategy around that um, other than the fact that we are still busily at work on the budget. Um, yeah. I think that the hours would be comparable to the hours that are covered in the, the um, contract right now. I'm not sure how many hours that is, but I think it's less than, less than full time. The way this reads, I thought this was for a teacher at each school to take on some additional responsibility, but no? It, it's not a teacher for each school. It would be shared staff. We're not adding forward positions for garden classroom coordinator um, we are adding one. Am I, am I wrong about that? I thought it was an existing person who took on some additional responsibilities, a couple hours a week or something, at each of the schools. I thought that's the way that's the way it read to me. But what? Yeah, so what, it does read that. Read it that we way. hadn't determined talking with the principals. We hadn't determined whether it was going to be one person to cover all, or it would be someone appointed at each one of the schools for a smaller amount. We're trying to work that piece out in between the budget piece and what needs to be done. Um, so we hadn't decided that it was going to be a position that was on the list that we had. But this is just to approve the job description, right. and then right. obviously the budget would spell out right. what what type of an FTE it is or how many FTEs it would be. Okay, so but but just by the fact that this is a faculty member, this is a teacher A position, as opposed to a full-time non-professional position, right? It is unit A, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, thank you. Ms. Boss? So I actually had a similar question. It wasn't clear to me if this was an add-on 
in hours kind of like coaching a sports team where e yeah. teachers at the individual elementary schools might help with the garden at each school versus a uh, half to full-time employee district-wide and so while I think it's a wonderful thing that we have these gardens um, for me it, we, that piece needs to be better understood I think as part of a job description and also just talking about priorities for example we don't have librarians and other things like that where does this fit in are there ways to maintain these gardens in a meaningful way use them as a classroom without hiring a full-time teacher district-wide and it's for 12 months and I, I don't know the answers to those so I, I think that we'll be able to clarify some of that through the budget presentation um, I do know that the principals feel strongly that this position is needed in order to maintain the garden program going forward and have committed significant funds from their own cost centers to do it Mr. Meyer. Uh, just if it's a unit A employee, will we need to negotiate an MOA for the summertime since their report period is the school year? Well, since the whole contract is up for negotiation, I think it could be embedded within the, the have agreement. To think of that, though. Okay, so um, I don't recall. If there's been a motion yet to approve the job description, so Molly did. I did okay, enthusiasm. that's right. Enthusiasm. That's right. <laughs> yes. Okay. It's been seconded. Um, so, Ms. Busanski, you had a question. So, will we get a, another version of this? You said it'd still be sort of, sort of being sorted out. Whether it's going to be one person or four. The way it reads now, it seems more like. So the job description support. clarifies. If, if I may. Sure. The yeah. job description clarifies the duties that whoever is doing this or however many people are doing this have to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And then through the budget process, we'll be able to give you more clarity on whether it's one person, whether it's two people, whether it's an add on, whether it's a separate thing. Um, right now, this work, as I said, is being performed by a contractor. So we're trying to figure out what the transition looks like. But we want to have at least the essential job descript, uh, requirements. Spelled and I just wasn't clear. So it will be a full-time position, or it'll just be additional hours to somebody's current job. So I think that again, that's something we need to work out. I see. There's a 12-month component to this, so right. that may limit our ability to recruit people. I think it may well be an additional hours that someone who's currently working in the school does. But I don't have the answer to that question at okay. this time. But you're not committing to that by voting for this. You're just right. committing. And I'm creating very the job. excited that we're doing this. <laughs> by the way, I want to show my enthusiasm for incorporating the school garden. I know that the teachers, NEF, has backed this for years longer. They made an exception longer than anything else, mm -hmm. and I'm really excited that this is this is a missing piece to it. But I, I think it's great. Okay. So there has been a motion made and seconded to approve this job description. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we have a report. This is from um, our colleague, Ms. Fallon, on her uh, recent uh, trip to Washington, D.C. for the National School Board Council committee or something like that it's going to be the Laura, be the Laura okay. Fallon show no. for the next yeah. hour I, I will try to make it quick Seven. so it was the National School Boards Association hosts the Federal Advocacy Institute in um, Washington DC um, and as a member of their federal relations network I was able to attend um, some of the things that we talked about um, were for instance um, last in December now um, Congress passed a, the 2018 farm bill um, legalizing the use of um, CBD, one of hemp's byproducts at the federal level and the implications that that's going to have at the state level. Um, so it's the first piece of federal legislation um, that was legalizing hemp and removing its DEA um, Schedule One controlled substance label. And so they were talking about what other states have done to the, at this point as far as policy around um, medical marijuana use in schools. Typically right now we've got um, policies even the states where it's legal you aren't allowed to publicly consume it and so it's not been allowed in schools but as of last month I think it was just yeah just in January alone uh, Colorado Delaware Florida 
Illinois, Maine, New Jersey, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Washington, and West Virginia all passed laws or policies allowing specific uses on school grounds with parameters in place. And so it was really interesting to see how other states were approaching this um, issue and where we could head um, ourselves. Um, another seminar that I went to um, and something that we advocated for very strongly um, with our Congress uh, congressional <coughs> representatives was the Higher Education Act is about to be reauthorized. Um, <coughs> and really talking about um, how we could use this reauthorization process to strengthen and build um, the educator workforce and really make sure that we are um, keeping in place, uh, that we're using the opportunity to strengthen our teacher preparation programs and that we're keeping in place loan forgiveness programs um, that will that districts rely on to attract quality um, educators to the workforce and to retain them. Um, and then another issue that we discussed was um, that I brought up at the joint committee meeting was the 2020 census um, and they were really talking about the importance of getting a complete count and how that will impact funding and all other areas of our lives um, and what we as school committee members can be doing to make sure that we're doing outreach so that people understand the importance of filling out the census. Um, the heart, one of the most undercounted groups is um, children up to nine years old and they talked about all of the reasons why and the barriers to participation and how we could be um, helpful in trying to do outreach in those areas so I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. Um, but the big push was, um, and I think this is so important, is um, the Individuals with Disability Education Act um, was passed in um, 1975. It's only been reauthorized five times in all of those years, um, and it's up for reauthorization again. Um, but when we talk about, we talk, we keep, we've been focusing on the funding at the state level and how everything's subject to appropriation. That's what's happening at the federal level with the Individuals Dis with Disability Education Act. Um, the commitment when it was first um, implemented and um, enacted in 1975 was that Congress promised to pay 40% of um, the average per pupil cost for every student who was served under this. And <laughs> Not only are they not fulfilling that commitment, it's actually declining in recent years. For the past, for last year, they actually funded 16% of their commitment of, uh, um, to, to funding that. So, um, and, and of course we've got the same issue that we have at the state level where when, um, when the IDEA was first enacted, it was estimated the cost to educate a child with disabilities was twice that um, of other students. And so they set that f maximum federal contribution at 40% of the average per pupil expenditure. But as we all know, it costs for students with multiple disabilities more than twice of that. So even just the basic assumptions that they had back in 1975 are now proven to not be accurate. And we're still not funding even half of what, of what they promised to us. So for example, just to give you some numbers, um, the average per pupil expenditure, which they set the federal level is set each year um, it was eleven thousand six hundred sixty six dollars for last year and the funding that we're receiving this year was less than one thousand seven hundred sixty dollars um, which was, at, was about sixteen percent um, and so I think that this is a really important issue I think this is something we need to be advocating for you see how slow this the progress has been on um, getting the um, foundation budget review recommendations implemented. I mean, we're still not there and it's been years. They, um, the National School Board Association is estimating this is a 10-year path. It's going to take us 10 years. That's what we're pushing to try and get this reauthorized and fully funded. And, and so it's going to take years and a lot of us paying attention and keeping our eye on what's going on in Congress. Um, and I think that it's really important. Um, so I hope that we can continue to advocate for this. Um, we were able to, I was able to go um, meet with uh, Representative uh, Congressman Reg uh, McGovern, um, <coughs> Moulton, uh, Neal, and Kennedy while I was there. And uh, we, we split up and everybody, we managed to cover all of the um, congressional delegates from Massachusetts. And they were all very receptive, but 
who knows who will be in office in 10 years when we finally get to the point where we're reauthorizing. Um, the only thing that we, that we advocated for for Massachusetts that was not a part of what the federal agenda was for the National School Board Association was, and this is really complicated, but it was the elimination of the, wind, uh, the windfall elimination pr provision and the government pension office offset, which I knew nothing about. I don't know if any of you know what it is, but essentially when the, um, when the old age survivors and disability insurance trust funds were near bankruptcy in 1983, part of what they did to bolster the system was to um, add these, this windfall elimination provision and government pension offset. And it affects only 15 states, Massachusetts being one of them. But essentially it means that public sector employees that then try to enter no, sorry, private sector employees that then try to enter the public system, public sector program, um, are disinc that there's a disincentive because they lose their mm -hmm. pension mm -hmm. or their spouse's benefits as well. And so it's been a real problem, particularly in the vocational schools and in the STEM fields, because people aren't going to want to enter a profession if it means that they're going to lose out on pension benefits. And so there's been a push in Massachusetts, at least, to repeal that um, government pension offset and the windfall elimination provision um, now that the Social Security system is a little bit more stable and it's stronger. So that was what we were wow. advocating for. Did you meet Betsy DeVos? Um, so, yeah. She spoke. Yeah. I didn't meet her. We were waiting. But she came in through a back door in a wheelchair. She'd had a terrible mm -hmm. accident. And um, so she she snuck in and out a back door. Kimmy, you were shaking your head about the windfall thing. Yes, because we all have to sign it when we take a job in municipal governments, knowing that we have been told it will affect our Social Security. And you've been told. Okay. So there'll be that offset that'll, that'll yep. okay. Yeah, if you, if you collect a government pension in Massachusetts from the state, your Social Security will be affected. Okay. Thank you for so that. That, that. So now we'll move into the um, next show. Rules and Policy uh, Subcommittee uh, reports. And, um, and we have a couple uh, votes that have been requested to, um, to send some policies to Rules and Policy. Do you want to describe those and make the motions? Okay, so the first, the first thing I would like to do is um, explain it and then I can make the motion. Is that okay? Okay. So. Uh, under the Every Student Succeeds Act, federal law was requiring school districts to make accommodations for both children um, of active duty military families and um, children of children who have been placed in foster care. So the Federal Department of Education and the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education issued guidance in these areas. We're not required to have policies. Um, However, having a policy would provide us with the opportunity to educate staff and the community on the compliance with the law through policy guidance. It was a conversation that we had in subcommittee this week about whether or not we thought it was necessary to have a policy. Um, and I think that obviously by asking you to refer it, it's clear that we, um, we decided that it was an opportunity to inform the staff and the public about what those requirements are and our compliance with them. Um, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees has um, outlined new policies um, and they've their JFABE education, opportun education opportunities for military children and JFABF uh, education opportunities for children in foster care. And so we would like to ask your permission um, to have you uh, to let us draft policies on those two topics. So I would like to make a motion um, to, to authorize the Rules and Policy Subcommittee to draft those policies. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Next. Okay, so the next um, vote is to refer a lot of policies. I'm gonna explain uh, them separately. So um, 
First, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act went into effect April um, of 2018, and it amends state law to prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of pregnancy and pregnancy-related conditions, such as lactation. Uh, we're asking that you refer policies AC, which is non-discrimination, ACA, non-discrimination on the basis of sex, uh, GBA, equal employment opportunity, GCF, professional staff hiring, JB, equal opportunity. Uh, educational opportunity and JFBB school choice so that the rules and policy subcommittee can update them and add the term pregnancy or pregnancy related condition to them um, do I need can I do this separately or do I need to go through all of it and take just them make, all as one vote no, just make a motion to refer them all as listed okay well because there are more than there's what there are more yeah. I only got up to JFBB so why don't you do, the, do them all the so we can okay. take one vote um, so JFF is actually, it's a typo, so we're not going to be voting on that. Okay. I'll bring the um, policy JJF to you um, to it's be voted on. It's JJF? Mm -hmm. Is that? So it was a Scrivener's error. Right? Yeah, okay, can that be a I, I don't think that, I mean, mm -hmm. I okay, the public so was on notice we were going to be voting on a J policy, so. We're okay, so policy JJF is the student activity accounts. It's cross-listed with policy DM, which we will be doing a first reading of tonight. It's kind of the mother document. It's, they're both <laughs> titled student activity accounts, but um, policy JJF is the shorter version, condensed version, um, and um, that, yeah, we'd like to make some changes to that. Um, based on um, guidance that was given to us by the Ethics Commission advisory report that came out. Um, and then, <laughs> so the next batch of document, so it's policy IHAM-1 is parental notice relative to sex education. It dates back to 1997 um, and it has five, this is what that one to five in parentheses, it has five letters attached to it. It's notice to parents of high school students, life skills students, seventh and eighth graders, sixth graders, and fifth graders. We'd like you to refer them to the rules and policy group so that we can work on them all together with um, Karen Jarvis Vance and update them and bring them into this okay. century. Okay. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, we're asking you to refer policy IKF graduation requirements as we discussed earlier so that we can discuss the history requirements for graduation. So I would move to refer all of the aforementioned policies to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded. Um, any discussion? All those in favor of that referral, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now you have a series of first readings. Yeah. So policy DN is the most important we wanted to talk about tonight. Um, as well, most time sensitive. Um, it was our current policy stated that supplies, equipment, or real estate which have no further value to the school department shall be turned over to the city property committee for disposition. There is no city property committee um, and we have had no policy guidance on how to dispose of anything in the meantime. Um, and this came to light when, on, with the Bridge Street School um, Library renovation. They have new um, furniture and equipment and books but they don't know what they can do with the old. So we sat down with um, our business manager and she um, helped us develop a new policy for the disposal of um, of school property and so in light of the fact that we have new furniture coming in and not a policy under which we can dispose of the old policy I would like to ask that we waive our rules and have the first and second reading and vote tonight on just this policy um, so, uh, so, okay, and are we going to do a first reading on DM too, or? No, just on DN, just the school property disposal okay. so that we could. Okay. So, we've done a, um, we've just done the first reading, so, um, would you like to make a motion to suspend our rules to allow for a motion to, right. to take a So, second? I'd like to, I'd move to suspend our rules so that we could suspend our second reading and take a vote? Is that yeah, we'll suspend rules to take a second reading and vote on the same night. Okay. Second. Second. Any discussion on that? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> abstentions? So now a motion would be in order to, um, to take a vote on second reading, if you want to make that motion. So 
Is I mean, is there any discussion? Has everybody actually read the policy? I'm assuming <laughs> you trust run me. this by the chief, the procurement officer, and it complies with you know. This was one of the policies that Candy had actually drafted before she left. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, that she worked on. So, Perfect. and it's pretty common practice from school district to school district, similar kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I have no concerns about it. Okay. Any other concerns? questions? Okay, so there's been a motion made um, and seconded to um, take to approve the policy now on second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, great. Uh, moving right along, um, we have next. We have a first reading of policy DM. Um, that's also cross-listed as policy JJF, which you just voted to refer to us. I'd like to um, postpone consideration postpone on this consideration one. of that policy so that we can actually look at them both together. Because as I said, they're linked. They're, they're almost identical. That's fine. Um, so I'd like to pull that one off. And then we would move to the first reading of policy FF, names, naming and memorials. Um, this is the policy we've been working on for six months. More. Um, we have listed on here policy, a first reading of policy FFA. That was the MASC's recommended policy on memorials. However, we won't be discussing that because we've decided to combine FF and FFA into one concise policy FF naming and memorials. Um, and we realized when we were working on this that we had two scenarios. We had uh, new buildings that we needed to find a name for and then we had groups that wanted to honor someone and they were looking for something to name um, and so this sort of incorporated both of those um, possibilities without being overly prescriptive and it kept the focus on we felt on learning and on um, unifying the community um, so there are a couple typos that I'm sure <laughs> Howard's gonna <coughs> point out to us well, but I would move. Oh no, we don't have to move anything. This is a first reading, so. Yeah. Do you, does anybody have any? I mean, again, what the, this, this reason this took so long for us to come up with is because we had a number of concerns we tried to address in a variety of different ways, <coughs> both in terms of making sure that our names are uh, <coughs> reflective and welcoming to all of our students and all the families in Northampton. Um, concern about uh, the fact there's a limited number of big buildings um, and, in the, and, and wanting to make sure that um, so you don't have sort of any kind of races involved about naming things and at the same time making sure that any naming is actually an honor and not um, doesn't become trivialized if you're, as you're seeking things to name after someone and so it was sort of like looking ahead, a lot of this was looking ahead and saying, you know, in 30 or 40 years, we might have to draw a line. It would be better if we drew, drew the line now and, and made a clearer statement of sort of what should be named how, in which direction. And so this is where we ended up, but it, there's been plenty of discussion, is all I can assure you all. So if you had to describe where you ended up, just for the public. Yeah, so where we ended up was that with things that we, the school committee, think need a name, we will appoint an advisory committee which will recommend a name for us and hopefully take into account all those factors of, you know, the, the, you know, the gravitas we hope to be associated with as well as the, you know, being welcoming and inclusive <coughs> to all the people in the town. Um, the, and then you know, we made a big change from the current policy, which is it would be put on the agenda for a meeting and have a vote, um, as opposed to a, a long, drawn-out process. Um, then the other thing is when people, when pe we really recognize that people want to honor people or perhaps commemorate events. There are a number of things which people would really like to do that with. And, um, and, and, it, and again, it seemed like a much clearer and more straightforward line to simply say, the, the, the buildings and the facilities, we won't use that way. Instead, people can really, as creative as they want to be in terms of things, I think we did a list of, for example, 
trees, scholarships, endowed lectures, or performances. But another suggestion that came up was purchasing books, or you know, any of a number of things which you can think of that um, are things which would be you know an, an enhancement for the school and for the students, and also um, you know a, a memorial or commemoration that will last for a long time in our community. So um, that's that's our hope that. That, that that strikes the appropriate balance. And we did consider, well, that was another issue when we talk about a memorial, the issue of, um, of counselors saying like that it's actually not healthy for kids to be sound, surrounded by memorials, you know, uh, actual plaques and uh, gravestones. Uh, gravestones essentially, and that's not what a, a school is for. Um, and so we were trying to think of ways to honor someone without having that that sort of physical plaque or memorial like or gravestone or um, any sort of right. structure like that so that we could keep the focus on learning and still offer opportunities to honor people who are important to the community. Does anyone have any questions about the policy on first reading or any suggestions or issues? Yes. I think you did a great job taking all the advice of the committee and thank you because I know it wasn't easy. <laughs> Okay. I think we should name this rule after you. <laughs> I, think, I think this was actually Mr. Moore's final verse. Yeah, like three pages. Mark, yeah. There's a Moore rule. This is Moore. How many buildings can you name for one school committee member? That's What's that? How <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, um, so that was a first reading, okay. and we'll put it on for a second reading and vote it next month. Uh, we will not be doing a first reading of policy GBEBD, which is a new policy. We don't have one, um, but the MASC had recommended policy GBEBD online <laughs> fundraising and solicitations crowdfunding. I'm going insane. Um, and uh, we're going to continue working on that. We, we did not get to a place that we were happy with that policy in our meeting on Monday. Uh, How fast can you say those letters know, together? <laughs> Pretty fast. <laughs> uh, next, we have a first reading of policy IHAMB, teaching about alcohol and drugs. Um, this is a new policy, one that we didn't have. It's based um, prim primarily on the sample policy provided by the MASC. We did make a couple of changes to it, but um, it is governed, most of the information in the policy is governed by Massachusetts General Law, um, Chapter 71, Section 1, and Chapter 71, Section 96. And uh, we also updated the cross-reference of JICH to um, reflect our recently adopted alcohol, tobacco, and drug use prohibited policy. I don't know if anyone has any questions or if there's any questions any discussion about this one on about first reading. One. Okay, so I think everyone's satisfied with that one on first reading. Next in the IH series. Okay, so yeah, last up is um, it was supposed to be a first reading of policy IHAE, IHAM, which is cross dual listed, really. Um, we are not going to be addressing that tonight. Um, the MASC recommends removing it entirely from the policy manual and including the information in ADF wellness, which we had referred to the Health Advisory Committee to work on. Um, but And we had also in subcommittee <coughs> talked about um, if we are keeping this, that we should align it with the other policies that we just asked you to refer to us, all of those parental letters home that are IHAMs. Um, and so, in any case, we are not ready to have a first reading on that policy because we're not entirely sure still where it's going. Okay. So that's my report. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Fallon uh, and the committee for your work. Um, now we move to the business manager's report and uh, followed by the personnel report. So included in your packet um, was business report. The first item in the uh, business report is the fiscal 19 appropriation report that is through February 8th. Um, there are a few accounts that um, have a deficit balance showing on the report at the moment. Uh, the legal services, student negotiations this year, special education contracted services, uh, long-term subs, the translations with the transfer that you did earlier this evening. Um, buyback and instructional software and maintenance are in the middle of preparing their transfers right now so that way we'll be 
updating those accounts. Um, so that information, if there's any questions you have on that report, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, the second item I have in the business report are the gifts from the PTO that are um, $1,000 or less. We've received actually 10 gifts from the JFK PTO, totaling $5,445.05, so um, ranging from uh, $285, the smallest one actually was $120, up to $1,000 for the 10 gifts. And the uh, item I have also in the report is the end of year audit report, which is ending for June 30th, 2018. Um, part of the process the Department of Ed requires is that we have an independent auditor, so our normal city auditors actually um, do that for us. Uh, they came in in um, December and reviewed the items, prepared the report. They noted a couple items that were reported on incorrect lines, so those corrections have been submitted to the Department of Ed already. Um, so I wanted to make sure you had that copy of that report. I'm not sure if you usually go to accept it or whether you just uh, have the information to review it. And the last item I have are the two warrants that uh, your representative have signed during the month of January. Any questions about the report this evening? The report? Okay. I'm hearing none. Then we'll move right into the superintendent report. Oh, I'm sorry. Personnel report. Uh, personnel report. Sorry. Uh, here we have seven new hires during January. Uh, we had three S ESPs, three custodians and one administrative assistant. Those were all replacements. There weren't new positions. We had three separations, and we had two transfers of ESPs. Excellent. Now we can move into the uh, superintendent's report. Thank you. It's really interesting how many of the themes that came out during discussion tonight are sort of tied up in the superintendent's report, and they're visuals. So let me start by passing this out. So if March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb, February came in with the district review and will go out with the first few budget. I'd like to thank everybody who helped or participated in the district review process. While it will be several months before we receive our district review report, we heard many positive comments on the preparation, organization, and high level of enthusiastic participation that was evident. both before and during the review. As I shared earlier, uh, in an earlier communication, a, the review team reported that we had participation from more stakeholders of every type of stakeholder that there is in a district than many of them had ever seen before, including those who had done the process in much larger districts. For those of you who accessed the public version of our document submission package, you know that we engaged in a thorough and very open self-study process. All told, we submitted more than 1,100 documents prior to the review and an additional number of documents that the team requested while they were on site. What is not so obvious is the work that went on behind the scenes and I'd like to share a little bit of that with you as a way of recognizing the dedication and even the forbearance that some of my staff showed throughout the process. In the beginning we decided to allot one day for document production for each indicator and we had pro I had programmed um, sev many score of daily instructions that went out to the alt team every morning at 8 a.m. would say something like this is indicator one this is lesson plans I need you to get all your lesson plans and submit to me by the end of the day every morning there would be another um, email that came out um, so the messages started going out in late August and continued through October 19th and I can tell you that those morning messages were not as eagerly anticipated as my snow calls but the team got the job done with very limited grumbling. Uh, logging in more than five hours of interviews during the on-site visits, Dr. Cheever took the prize for time on task. However, the most unsung hero of the whole process was Tracy Harity. Anyone who's been to the central office over the past several months will have seen the District Review Command Center, which you have a picture of in front of you. 
uh, our team chair bestowed on her the 2019 Efficiency Award, saying it comes without money, but with lots of smiles. <laughs> so, with the district review behind us, we turn our attention to the FY20 school budget. As some of you may have noticed on Facebook, the ALT team has had a number of meetings, including one where we were assisted by a therapy dog. As an ALT team, we've spent about 16 hours working on the FY20 budget over the course of five meetings. I've also held a number of small group meetings with elementary principals, middle and high school administration, and student services as we work out details of some of the budget concepts um, of, that were agreed to by the whole team. Cami and I met yesterday with the Budget and Property Subcommittee to go over a preliminary draft of the first view budget presentation. And so I just want to put out a notice, because it was shocking to some, um, that I've taken great pains to limit the number of slides in this year's presentation. Um, but the content was sufficient to spark about two and a half hours of really satisfying discussion on our next strategic moves to improve the schools. Um, so uh, we'll be adding a few slides, but not too many. Um, I look forward to sharing those ideas with you in, in a couple of weeks. Finally, uh, I wanted to share some information that I'll be s discussing tomorrow morning with our local legislative delegation. Actually, I'll be meeting with uh, representatives and senators from um, all the CES member districts as well as some from Worcester County and some from Hamden County as well. And much like the, um, the issue of the unfunded promise of IDEA, we'll be talking about some of the unfunded promises um, in the state budget. So I just wanted to share this with you for informational purposes. Um, it's an area where we are focusing our advocacy. It is consistent with what MASS is doing and their advocacy around the foundation budget review. So in addition to advocating for an accelerated process rather than the seven year fades in for reasons that I explained when I um, showed you what I think the likely outcome of a seven year phase in is, which is likely to be zero money, for Northampton. Um, we're also focusing on the other unfunded or, or underfunded programs within the state budget. So um, specifically looking at charter school reimbursement, circuit breaker, regional transportation, and homeless transportation. These are underfunded programs that affect just about all of the uh, CES member districts. You can see Northampton's total at the bottom of page one. Um, I will say that this is a conservative estimate because there are a couple of ways to calculate the charter school reimbursement um, underpayment and we took the more conservative approach, meaning the approach that um, minimizes the amount of the underpayment. For those of you who don't have this document in front of you, it's $215,277 for Northampton. Um, all the CES member districts combined is an amount of 3.9 million. This is based on FY18 numbers. Um, so part of the advocacy in the session that I'll be leading tomorrow is focused on not taking our eyes off of the other underfunded programs even while we try to get some movement on the Chapter 70 underfunded program. Um, and I think the mayor's budget presentation makes it clear why that's so important. Um, as you pointed out, in the governor's budget proposal, there's actually a net cut in state aid for education to Northampton. Um, there's a $56,000 increase in Chapter 70, but that goes along with a $121,000 reduction for charter school reimbursement. Um, so I'll be, and that's on top of a number that's already not fully funded. So. Um, that's what I'll be doing tomorrow morning um, and in the next few weeks as I put the final touches on my first few budget presentation. Um, I do think it's going to be a very positive presentation. I'm really happy with the way some things worked out and some things that I think we'll be able to do for the district next year. Um, I think it's really was really sort of um, satisfying to have the district review happening while we were working on the first few budget because 
it felt like we were getting some confirmation, not that any information has been shared, but it just felt like we were getting some confirmation that some of the concepts we were working on for the budget are likely to be the, the right concepts for Northampton. So that's my report. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we have some uh, future business and meeting dates. Um, we have the negotiating subcommittee uh, February 27th at uh, 5 p.m. at the JFK cafeteria. Um, we've got uh, the school committee's uh, uh, first sort of kickoff budget meeting uh, February 28th, 2019, and that's uh, where the superintendent will present the first view. Uh, that's at 6.45 p.m. in the JFK uh, community room. Um, I did want to note that um, one of our members will be out of state that day, um, but we are going to have, um, uh, we are going to use the um, laws, uh, open meeting laws ability to do a remote participation. Um, so we'll have a cardboard cutout of Miss Voss and we'll have a speaker phone there. And so um, she will be uh, participating um, and hopefully following along by watching the live stream uh, at home of the presentation, but we may, we'll be able to give her the slides maybe in advance just in case the tech doesn't work. Um, so that'll be kind of a first for us. Um, and um, school committee meeting of March 14th, 2019 at 645 in the JFK community room. And then the uh, second meeting in March for the school committee budget meeting, March 28th, 2019, 645 p.m. Uh, in the JFK community room. So if there's uh, nothing else, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So that does uh, conclude. School committee meeting of February 14th, 2019.